And today's guest on the Financial Planner Live podcast is Paul McCobry from Navigate IFA. We go deep into his career background and we talk about the power of sales. Why is sales such a dirty word in financial planning these days? Let's bring sales back again. He's a firm advocate of why financial advisors, mortgage advisors really do need to focus on their sales strategy when it comes to winning new business. We also talk about transitioning from mortgage and protection into financial planning. What are the good things about that? But what are some of the stumbling blocks that actually stop people from doing that, things like earning more money as a mortgage advisor, believe it or not. Now, also we talk about social media. He's really honest about his journey with social media. He's at the very beginning. He's thinking, should I do it? Shouldn't I do it? And I help him make a decision. I hope you love the episode. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today on the Financial Planner Life podcast. How are you? I'm very well. Thanks, Sam. Thank you for the opportunity. No problem. Hey, listen, I think I don't think I've ever had somebody from Ireland on the podcast. Well, I'm good to be the first then. There we go. Exactly. Fantastic stuff. But listen, thank you so much for joining us today. Like I said on the podcast, it's a careers based podcast. You yourself have had an, a, a decent career within financial planning. You've gone through all the different sort of channels and routes in and now you're yeah. running your own financial planning business. So that to me is really, really exciting. So interested in people that run their own businesses because there's so much that's gone on to get to that point. You know, there's so many paths that you've taken, troubles, problems, ups, downs, you know, it doesn't yeah. just go like that, does it? In some no, fluid motion yeah, no. all the way to the top. It could be quite difficult. So today we're going to learn a little bit about your experience, the ups, the downs, the pros, the cons, and some of the advice that you might give to some people who are thinking about getting into the profession or who might be in the profession right now thinking about taking the route that you've done. All right? Yeah. Brilliant, yes. I say what, let's start from the start. Let's start from the start. How did you get into the financial planning profession? Like many people, I think, in financial services, I fell into it. Uh, I left school in Belfast. And our school had an association with a a quite a well-known state agent in Belfast. And they took on an office junior, very junior at that stage. And I I didn't want to go to university. I was very much, I wanted to go and find a career and just get work. And I would have wasted, (laughs) university would have been a waste, enjoying myself. And the funny story is that within that estate agent, I, I got to know what I thought was a mortgage advisor. It turns out he was a full financial advisor doing mortgages. The guy, Brian. Brian used to come in at 10 and leave at 3. And in my early days, I used to, and he had to have a nice suit and a nice car. And I used to think that Brian does okay. But only later on did I realize Brian was going home at 3 to do the school run, to do the homeworks, and then go back out and do his calls at night. And I just, Brian talked me through, how do you get into this? And he says, just do your FPCs, one, two. That's how old I am, one, two, and three. And you work from there. And that was my then decision. That's where I wanted to go. I then was able to get into a an estate agency with a financial services arm to it. And that's where I started doing my FPC1, FPC2. And I just worked my way. And the next job after that was then where I went into Prudential. And Prudential was really where I... I really understood financial services. I was only 20 years of age and it was a fantastic, if you, um, if you remember back to the time, Sam, where they took the man from the, the man from the Prue off the street and the, uh, and the co-op, you know, uh, they took them off the street and we then, there's a, sorry, Sam, there's an internet. Is that, it's okay. So our internet's been funny today. It's just got a wee signal there. Sorry. The man from the Prue was taken off the street and we were then uh, came in as a sales team in order to contact Prudential clients with maturing endowments. And our sales pitch was to get them to reinvest their maturity into the, the, the Pru bond. And that was really where my financial career for the first you know, really took off. And I did. It was a great sales environment. We were all young and hungry, work hard, play hard. If you had done an exam, I'd have done an exam. And... That's where it ended. I ended up getting the full FPC three, and then I got a job in a bank as a trainee financial advisor. Let's stop there then, because a little bit to digest there. So you left the um, you left the estate agency, went and worked for Prudential. Now, this was pre RDR, I assume, yeah. Yes, two thousand. Uh, two thousand. Like two thousand. Yeah, so quite a little yeah. bit further back yeah. now. Yeah, totally get it. You know, bank like the bank assurance world, right? Let's just say that yes. product, product providers, bank assurance. There was. 
I think over a hundred thousand, I think there's nearly, nearly 200,000 yeah. financial planners or financial advisors, if we can call them financial yeah. advisors that are out there, you know, giving advice, whether it's a product provider, where it's, where, where it's for the banks. And it was very competitive, wasn't it? You know, I used to, I used to yeah. recruit for those positions. We were one of the top recruiters for Prudential at one point, um, you know, NatWest and, you know, Barclays, all these different uh, organizations having those financial advisors. And it was all league tables. It was very competitive, but I'll tell you one thing, the training was superb oh. so tell us a little bit about that because sales training in financial planning now seems to be a dirty word i think bring sales back to financial planning tell us a little bit about the experience that you gained the training you got around sales and why today do you think it's so so important for those financial planners coming through i think there's two points in that sam is going back to the man from the pre or the co-op man they were great salespeople. They, I remember them in my granny and granda's house coming on a Friday, having a cup of tea. That's right. I did my first ever, I think, £10 a month type small endowment 10-year plan. They got there, that, was the, that was the end of the savings culture in, in the UK when those guys were taken off the street because no one was selling those products. And um, obviously regulation and all then just came and, and, and things. So I think first and foremost, those were the guys that had great trust within families. And that's something that I took on in, in the job is to, that trust is so important. When you then talk about sales training, Prudential was the best, Was it was just a, a great place. I, I can't say about the young work hard play or an attitude. It's so competitive, but in a great way. And Prudential taught us, so if you think about Customers had their maturing endowments. We have to phone them. It's typically between six o'clock and nine o'clock at night. Prudential taught us that in order to hit your targets, they had worked it out that you had to make 50 dials. Now, back then, it was a proper dial. <laughs> Not quite the round and round circles, but it was a proper dial. You had to make 50 dials and you would get talking to 20 on average. And if you get talking to 20 on average, 10 would take an information pack and one sale would come out of that so that was your ratios and that's what you just worked at every single day was hit your 50 guys and a few we did work hard and play hard so some days maybe not as productive but you knew across that week that you needed to hit those 250 guys for that to wash down in order to hit a sale a day 20 sales a day and back then that took you into really generous bonus territory again another seems to be word we're not allowed to say in our industry and what that taught me was and I still use it to this day. What can I control? How many phone calls am I making a day? How many professional connections am I meeting a week? And if I can make sure that I'm consistent in that approach, the rest tends to sort itself out because mm -hmm. you can't really control. So Prudential taught me that. And as you say, moving on to the bank then, you said about the training. I had 12 weeks in a hotel put up for training. It was, again, good crack. Uh but I could do a role play with you now, which explains the IDD or the presentation they did about holistic planning. It was that drill that this. You, you don't get that, you know. So for me, I feel incredibly lucky and grateful that that, that was the training and that was the foundation. And I still use many of the, the skills today. Fantastic. That's exactly what I was going to ask you. What you learned in those days. Do you think that's fundamental to the success that you've now you're now experiencing at this stage of your life? Definitely. I think consistency is the key, isn't it, when it comes to finances, learning, training, going to the gym. And for me, that's what that taught me. And as I say, when I talk to my advisors now, what can we control? We can only control how many people we speak to, as in calling out, speaking to your clients, making sure you're doing your annual contacts, and how many professional connections do we have and that we're having proper meetings with them. The rest of it is a bit out of our control. So if you focus on those, typically I find the rest looks after itself. So when we talk about, you know, it's a really interesting area and I, I'm, I'm absolutely with you. And, you know, I'm, I've been running a recruitment company for 15 years. I'm 42 years old. I, I remember one of my very first jobs when I left school was selling windows for Stay Bright Windows. So I get given like a <laughs> pad of paper, like literally like the yellow pages and you had to go through and like scribble it off and then make a phone call. And I'm trying to sell windows to people. I mean, I knocked on people's doors. So one of my jobs was like, like selling charities. You know, I wasn't a naturally academic person. You know, I was willing yeah. to go out and knock on people's door to learn a trade, to learn how to communicate with people, to learn how to sell. And all of that back then was numbers game. It was always just drilled into you. Look, you know, learn your product, 
understand how to ask the right questions. So open questions and all those typical types of things, yeah. USPs, unique selling points, features and benefits, all those typical real basic sales um, techniques. It could be mirroring somebody, you know, the power yeah. of open and closed questions. And I took that from that basic form where I had to knock, I had to knock a hundred doors a day in the yeah. range. You know what I mean? If I did a hundred doors in a day, I should earn a hundred pounds. It was self-employed, you know, it was yeah. 10 pound the door, let alone if I ended up knocking on the door and I got them to sign up to three things, it could be 30 quid. So I learned about cross selling as well, cross selling yeah. and upselling and all that typical type of stuff. It was such a powerful ground for me to build resilience and also the numbers game, what you put in, you get out at the end of it. I think, you know, where you work for the banks, where you work for those product providers and they put you through those training processes, you don't get that today as a financial advisor. You don't get that no. going into a smaller financial planning practice. You're kind of going down the admin power planner route to then become a financial planner. And I think you're massively missing that in-depth sales training, that, that, that thing that builds resilience. And I put a post out quite recently and I said, who here has confidence in their business development and who doesn't 48% of people said, no, I need help. 26% of people said, I'm highly confident in this. Everyone else yeah. was kind of kind of confident or whatnot, but that tells me that nearly 50% of the people, and I know who voted. So I can look at all the people that have voted. Mm -hmm. Right. And I can see that they've been doing the role for quite some time, but they don't have confidence in their ability to generate business. Yeah. So let's just talk about that right now. What do you think are some of the things that a financial planner who might be struggling right now, they've got the qualifications, perhaps they've even got competent advisor yeah. status, but they're not hitting their goals of building professional relationships or new client inquiries. What can they do right now? What do you, what do you think they should do? Yeah. I feel old because this would have been my tactic maybe 15 years ago. Well, for, to me, at first, so we've all got mobile phones now and we've all got lots of numbers on the mobile phone. Most of your friends are willing to help you. So for me, it's about contacting them, explaining them that you're in, you're in a new role and that you need to go and maybe conduct some fact finding. So you're obviously looking for friends who potentially maybe have mortgages, life insurance, maybe starting a savings plan you can narrow it down pretty well now that would be always be my first port of contact get them on board are they aware of what you're doing are they aware that they that you need help and to me in my career when i ask and i say look i need help people will want to help you when i think about building the network the best thing that i was involved in was bni so bni for those who don't know is a a global networking group that meets once a week. You're only allowed one of each profession in it. And the whole idea is that you only get referrals. I was in it for nine years and I only left because Navigate became a bigger company. And my role wasn't so much about getting new clients. It was about managing the business, et cetera. But two of my advisors have been in it. One is still in it to this day. But B and I just grew your network because it taught you how to talk about your business in 60 seconds, an elevator pitch. It taught you how to introduce you to solicitors, accountants, the key people of influence, build relationships, get them to help you, you help them, and that grew. And over nine years, Sam, I did fantastic business. Even to this day, I get business of that because now when my friends would always, for a laugh, say, I know everybody if I need someone for this, someone for that. And I came from just building that network. And funny, since I left, which is maybe five years ago, I do feel my network has shrunk. Um, but to me, that's another to have a look at BNI. Only one of any profession can join a BNI chapter. So that might make it difficult. Mortgages, IFAs are well taken because you think it's a people, people trust referral. But there's other networking groups. Just get your I used to have a little saying and it's called, you just never know. I'd went to an opening of an envelope. You just never know who you might meet. This the unfortunate thing is you get busier and more successful, all those we think you don't have time for them, but they are the they are the foundation. So get out, contact everyone you know, tell them what you're doing, give them your number, get their email address, send a monthly newsletter, ask them, can you come and do a fact find, then work on how do I get myself out there. You're more of an expert than me when it comes then to the social media side. And I do feel like a dinosaur when it comes to that side of things. But from a very basic view, that's what I would be doing.
But the thing is, though, you say you feel like a dinosaur, right? But the area where you're an expert in is the area now where people are struggling. So they do a lot. What you tend to find is that people are putting, they're doubling down and putting energy and effort into social media, but they're not doing it right on the social mm -hmm. media side. So they're not getting that quick return or they're spending their time on social media, observing and watching others, but not doing anything themselves. So they're kind of almost watchers, but also as well, mm -hmm. they're not even using social media as a tool to network. LinkedIn is networking on steroids, right? Mm -hmm. well, you, would have, you would have gone through to a BNI meeting, right? You go into a BNI meeting face to face. You can't beat it. You can't be, you know, you can't yeah. be a better, you know, face to face relationship is completely different from the telephone, right? Completely different, even completely different from the video chat that we're having now, which is still pretty damn good. But the thing is, when you go onto somewhere like LinkedIn, if you're not actively searching out the people that you want to talk to, if you're not actively reaching out to them with something of substance, if you're not reaching out to them to get them booked in for a video call or for a face to face meeting where you can talk about your services, how you can support each other then you're losing, you're missing out. And that's what BNI has taught you, right? And it goes back also to the fact that it's a numbers game. That, that's a point. You know, I think also, yes. I think also, Sam, you're talking about the Zoom calls, et cetera. I find since COVID and the younger advisors in here, they're still too top heavy in Zoom compared to face to face. I would even say to them that you should be, especially in the mortgage and protection or you're starting the saving plan, the first saving plan, get out to their house, get the information, get the job done there and then make it as easy as possible for them and then make them a client and move on. There's a wee bit of that has got lost since we went to the Zoom generation. It's amazing. Yeah, I going from like, so everything used to be, every, for me, everything used to be like phone based. So phone, phone as many people as you can, because you can speak to more people, right? Speak to more people. Mm -hmm. Again, it's a numbers game. Then you go into Zoom and that changed it. It changed it. I built, yeah. I built deeper relationships because I can't, because you know, when you're on a phone call, all you can do is hear somebody. You can't see yeah. somebody. You can't see the whites of their eyes. You can't connect with them, right? But there's something that Zoom lacks, which is that almost energy, energy connection. Mm -hmm. So if you and I were sitting down next to each other right now, there would be a different energy. You know, we're yeah. present in the same room together. It's a very different feeling. And if you put that in, in order, phone to video to face to face, face to face is always a deeper connection. Yeah. It's, she, she can a hand. Yeah. It's always a, the physical is always a much deeper connection. So when you're building out your plan of how do I go out and see people? Well, yeah, build in how many phone calls you want to make, build in how many Zoom calls you want to make, but also build in how many face to face can I do? Because I bet yeah. you some of the best clients that you know and the best clients that refer to you, whether they're introducers or existing clients passing you through, I bet you've met them all, wouldn't you? Exactly. You've had coffees with them. You've had beers with them, maybe. And you have to, to me, you have to meet like each other in order for that to go to the next level. Yeah. And, you know, going out for a beer, bite the eight is always the best way. And also they've got to understand what you do. In our financial planning world, you know, Many accountants that I know don't understand what we do. They still think all oh, we do is sell funds. Yeah. When actually you need. So I often say to my ones, my advisors, go and do a financial plan for them. Just to the cost you an hour of your time. Just do a plan. Show them how the cash flow software works. Then I bet you they'll get bought in because it's very unlikely that their existing advisor or what they've done before has ever talked to them about this. Especially accountants because they understand the numbers and. No one's ever talked about how much they need. Well, that's a really great sales technique. That's a great way to build a relationship really quickly is to actually give a financial plan to the introducer. Get out of your head that you're transact it's transactional. Get out of your head, I'm going to make a phone call and all of a sudden they're going to start passing me business. If you yeah. actually sit down with them for an hour and deliver the financial plan, which let's face it, is the sexy part of financial, <laughs> financial yeah. advice, isn't it? It's the part that actually creates an emotional connection because someone then has to think about themselves. They have to think about their future, their family future. Do they have enough money? So yeah. all of a sudden they're confronting those feelings, those emotions, those beliefs. And then when you then guide them down a pathway, dependent upon how brilliant your financial plan uh, process actually is, really you should be taking on an emotional journey. So as they're going on that emotional journey, Obviously, a byproduct of that is they're building a connection with you. Now, if they're feeling positive about the experience they're having with you, you're sure as shit they're going to be positive about putting you in front of their clients, right? 
Yes. And previous experience will be the old school salesperson, where if you show them that it's done differently, they'll get their eyes open. As you say, if you can just tune into the family, the emotional attachment. I think also just thinking while you're talking, Sam, for a new advisor starting out, maybe they don't want to do mortgages because their pathways into the financial planning side, but never forget the importance of protection. I was taught that years ago. We work our mortgage and protection business as part of the Primus Network, and they have a 501 club. And the whole idea is get into five, 501 pounds of premium a month, get into that club. They send league tables every day. It might be seen as old school uh, sales tactics, but see for driven advisors, it works. But if you're looking to build your AUM and your ongoing fees is very difficult. It is a long-term process. But if you can hit 300, 400, 500, 501 in protection a month, that's a really good income which then builds the income, allows you a bit of time in order to plant seeds, in order to find what I would call my ideal client. I love that. Fantastic. I want to explore that a little bit further, but it's a great opportunity for me to plug um, the Just Covered podcast, actually. Uh, the Just Covered podcast is Legal in General for Advisors podcast, yeah. host by Hazel and, and, and Wayne. And here at the Financial Planner Life Studios, we, we do all the production for that podcast. So if anyone's actually listening and wants to learn more about how to position protection advice in your process, how to connect with customers and clients in a different way, and the importance really of protection. I mean, it's a, such an important part of yeah. the financial planning process, right? Is to listen to that podcast, it's peer-to-peer -peer learning and it's experts like yourself. In fact, I'm gonna mention to Hazel, I think you should go on there actually, because I bet you've got lots Thank of really, really good advice to give. <laughs> um, but it's a great way to work out how to position protection. So listeners, check it out, the Just Covered, Just Covered podcast. I'll tell you what, let's go back to this because you made a pretty good point there. Building assets under management doesn't happen overnight. There's very few financial planners that I know that have just started out that all of a sudden have 5 million, 10 million under management. They usually take a couple of years to get going and then it starts to trickle in, right? It starts to come on in through the relationships they build, the confidence, how they deliver yeah. their financial plans. But a quick way to make money, a quick way to build client relationships is a simple process of selling protection. Yeah. Sell, selling protection being the, <laughs> the important word. Is sell, selling the protection and then you can work on, you can work then. I, I, I don't worry about AEM quite often. You can ask me, what's your business AEM? Do you have? I go on ongoing fees because we have a lot of younger, I'm going to say younger, let's take a 40 year old business owner, don't have 100 grand they invest today, but they have a thousand pounds a month. We have a lot of them now paying us. We have over 2,000 pounds a month comes in and go cardless from that type of client. Yeah. You know, so by doing the, and a lot of them will have done protection along the way. So they become a really good client because you've got the commission, mm. you get them sorted with the foundational stuff. Mm. If you've got a mortgage, if you're a mortgage advisor, a mortgage contact, you get the mortgage into the fixed deal and you've got that. And then you're just working your way up, aren't you? So if you think of, uh, I was taught from a very, very good old school sales guy about, you know, as many products can you have a client with? And if you think in our business, there's lots. So Santander, I forget, Santander's target is to have every customer having something like 11 products. So from the current account, the savings account, to the credit card, to the mortgage, because once they're in, they're in, it's very hard for them to move. And so if you think about it like that, by doing your protection, writing it into trust, maybe then contacting the trustees if you want to really push on, uh, offering a free will. We offer all our mortgage protection clients a free will using free uh, a will. We pay for software from a company, but we offer it out for free. And that's a great way of getting that foundational stuff. Then you can start doing the savings plans and you can start potentially. So you might not get a fee in day one, but maybe three years down the line, they move into proper planning. They trust you. They're, you're worth every penny. They'll pay you then what, you, what you're worth. And all of a sudden, you're starting to build it up. And there's lots of opportunity out there that the advice gap has created that. I love it. Brilliant. That's some really good advice. I think, do you know what? I've not done this before, but are you able just to break down the difference between commission and um, ongoing fees from assets under management? Because I think people often get confused and commission again is a word in financial planning that doesn't get used that often, but you do get commission still in financial yeah. in, in financial advice. Can you just break that down just to, to, to differentiate between the two? Okay, so within Navigate, we have two businesses. We have our mortgage and protection arm and we have our financial planning arm. 
typically most of our protection will be done in the mortgage and protection business. Reason for that is that the guys that work in there are protection specialists. I can, to keep up with the critical illness plans, the income protection uh, plan, it's just it's a, a specialism I feel in as Excel. So if I have a client who who needs protection, I will bring one of the protection guys in to help them. But for protection, you can either get paid by commission from the provider, or you could charge a fee and take the commission off. If paid by commission, the, the, the customer will be paying for it over the over, over the plan. Uh, on the financial planning side, it's a full straight flat fee, professional service fee that's agreed up, up front, and we have that laid out in our uh, initial disclosure documents, et cetera, et cetera. Commission has become a bit of a bad word. Uh, some people don't even do it because they feel that mm -hmm. the client is paying for it. But if you give the client the opportunity, you we give the client the option, the fee first commission. The majority are going to take the they're going to take the commission. And for me, you, if you're doing it right, you're doing a proper job. You're protecting lives. I'm at an age now. I'm 43. I have had double figures of claims. My last five out of my last six claims, Sam have come from age 28 to 38. So those clients could not have afforded my fee to cover my time when I set up those mortgage protection policies. They pay the commission, and unfortunately they're needed, but between 20 and 38, like one was a death, or scary. So I did some claims videos with Legal in General, and it was so powerful listening to the stories where people had taken out protection and used it claimed it but stayed stayed alive um it was so powerful that i already had some already had some life cover in place but tristan who's my videographer went out and bought absolutely everything to cover himself because it was so powerful when you listen to those claim stories and you realize just how important protection actually is and why so many financial planners don't really do it <laughs> don't really they don't really push it because they're looking for that assets under management element it's such a it's such a key area to develop business. And what I liked as well is what you said about the trustee side of it. So when you write things into wills and things, and you can reach out to people like trustees, beneficiaries, there are opportunities there for you to actually start to network through the different connections that they put down on those forms. Um, yeah, very, very, very powerful stuff. Thank you for explaining that. No, I really, I really appreciate that because I think when people get into becoming a financial advisor, a financial planner, you know, you don't need all your level four qualifications to even to be able to sell um, life protection. You can just go out and be standalone life protection. You don't need every single qualification. You don't need to be level four qualified at cast status. You, part of your process to, to being an advisor could be cut your teeth in protection, do some protection, do some mortgage. What do you, I got, let's just talk about that. More Mortgage protection to financial planning. Do you think that's a really good route? Yes, that to me is the ideal route. The problem that we have, and you will know this better than me, is how do you make that leap? So to give you an example, so for me, as you say, people look down their nose a wee bit of mortgage and protection. No better place to learn your craft, to talk to many people a week. Uh, you know, our mortgage guys target 20 meetings a week in order to get a seal a day of mortgage and protection. Uh, best place to build a network, because the more mortgages you do, I still get calls. So if you want to be a financial advisor, that's going to be your first call when you're signed off as cast to go and do their savings plan, get the pension set up. And I just think it's a great way of learning. But here's the problem, and I have this at this minute in time with one of our top advisors. Mortgage advisor probably earning 70, 80 grand a year. In order to become a financial, he's got all of qualifications. In order to become a financial planner, he is probably going to have to take quite a significant pay cut because he's going to have to move into possibly client manager, admin, or maybe power planner, but he doesn't have the technical skills to even be a junior power planner. And he and I are trying to work that out at the minute. Now, one of the one of the ways of trying to do that is for him to have a junior mortgage advisor under him, so he can get the mortgage that mortgage advisor to do the mortgages. He continues to do his protection, and he then transitions across within w within the, the the financial planning business. But it's difficult. But yeah, to me, that's where you learn the basics. 
So interesting, a couple of things I'm picking up on there. One being it's like the, yeah, you're absolutely right. I know mortgage advisors that are earning £200,000 a year, right? So being, you know, they're thinking, oh, I could go be a financial planner. It's like, you know, not many financial planners I come across that actually earn £200,000 plus, right? It's, it's, it's not common to earn £200,000 plus in financial planning, unless, unless you run your own business, been doing, exactly. it for, doing it for quite some time, right? Let's just get that fact straight as well, I think. Now, but there is opportunity in mortgage advice to earn and protection to earn quite considerable money. Interestingly, you said that mortgage advice then across into financial planning that really that person should start in more of a junior like administrative power planning position why why can't they just transition from mortgage advice straight into full financial planning if they've got the training around delivering financial plans that's it as you said you're making me think it's a it's a fair point why do i think it's because the financial planning side and understanding the products, take pensions, for example, starting at the bottom to understand the nuances that come with the pensions, to working your way up doing a financial report, to then doing the planning side, takes experience and knowledge. Could this person, this person will be good salesperson, will be a good advisor, they've got the right ethics and morals. Could they go in and deliver the financial plan and then rely on our technical team behind them, potentially? but they would need to be in some way covering that cost. And how do they do that? And if you think on a on a £50 protection policy, this guy writes close to £500 a month premium. So if you take that, how much that is in income, that's a lot of financial planning clients to try and acquire. And it, it just becomes difficult. I think in a business like ours where we have both, we can make it work, yeah. but there's going to be an element of sacrifice in in the in your pocket. I think so, and that is another bit I wanted to look at here is the fact that you've got two. So it's interesting as a case study having you on the phone because to me it's like, and, and we're kind of we, you know we're spitballing here really because why can't that person go from mortgage to full financial planning? There isn't a reason why they should go down the admin power planner route. Yes, there has to be a justification to use that part of the business to to make it affordable, but. If they're a really good mortgage advisor and they're really good at selling and they're really good at going out and winning business, then the likelihood is they're probably going to be really, really good at going out and winning financial planning clients. They could even tap into the clients that they built underneath the mortgage side. Or have you already as a financial planning business, IFA business, had that business referred to you? No, typically they'll have come to the mortgage, the mortgage first and they haven't been... <laughs> The issue that we have in our financial plan and business is that the four advisors now are looking for minimum fee, you know, fifteen hundred pounds a year at least, or one hundred and fifty thousand of AUM would be what uh, our youngest advisor is looking at because he's building. He's in the eighteen months. We are not interested in the two hundred, three hundred, five hundred transactional savings plan. But maybe listening to you and just thinking about it quickly, that doesn't mean that that person can't do that. We just need to think about the ongoing service. And that's how I started by selling a five, you know, set you up and I said 500 pounds a month and, and it was a half a percent. But what happened in the last few years is I've had to go back and turn a lot of that off because the annual review process is far too arduous. And also they weren't in the full plan and it wasn't the IDs plan. But there's no reason to get started, but you have to sell a lot of savings plans to make yeah. up a 50 pounds life insurance. Or I suppose, and the other way you look at it is, is if, say, for example, as a business, as an IFA business, you have a number of financial planners that have built client relations up to the point where they can then be passed on to somebody else. That's a shadow advisor, but that's... Let's talk yeah. about that. You know, let's talk, I, I like what you say, the word shadow advisor. So why don't you elaborate on what you mean by that and how you've and what you've done around having a shadow advisor in your business? I have been, I'm in year two out of three on Brett Davidson's course. You know Brett? No. So Brett runs a course called Uncover Your Business Potential. It's for financial advice business owners and their team to take your business to the next level. And his argument or his business plan is that I am best suited to be out getting new clients. Find the client and then have a shadow advisor who you've trained from whatever level up. 
So I've done this for, with Matt in our office, who's went from power. He started off with Capita, learned a lot about pensions, which put him in a really great place. Came to me as a power planner, and then now he worked his way up. And Matt just shadowed me. So I'd have met you, say, at a network meeting. Come on in, Sam, we'll have a meeting. Introduced you to Matt. Matt then learned the ropes, how to do it, worked his way up. And now he shadows me in that he, okay, Sam, come in and see me, look. I'm always busy. I'm always out and about, but Matt will be the one who will provide the advice and arrange everything for you. No one ever says anything. And now Matt is a fully fledged advisor standing on his own two feet and covering his cost. And this is what he's worked for. Certified financial planner, close to being chartered, 32 years of age. Brilliant. So it's the only way if you're going to grow to that next, if you're going to try and grow your business and we're not looking like... uh, we have four advisors. One new client a month is if we find that one new client at a month at about two hundred and fifty of AUM, that's sort of our bread and butter. And um, if we that's our organic growth. But if you're wanting the younger generation to come through, because I might get out of this business, I know I'm not as it stands today selling to a consolidator. I uh, wouldn't do it to my clients. So I think in my head, the younger generation are the ones that potentially could buy me out or at least allow me the flexibility and to earn an income and work work on. So I think the shadow advisor's the way to grow up. It just takes a while. Are you it's a two to three year from yeah, you know, and, and, and that's where probably the difficulty lies. So when we talk back to what we were saying about mortgage advice being a really good option to go down, you learn some amazing skills in mortgage advice and protection, but your earnings go up, therefore stepping across and even into a shadow advice role. So, you know, having somebody come into the business who is a shadow advisor, doesn't have any clients, but they're level four qualified, great potential. I mean, those those roles aren't out there in abundance, right? But they will be out there more so. That, that That is going to be kind of out there more so over the next, say, one, two, three, four, five years without a shadow of a doubt, right? There's a pun in there, shadow of a doubt. But the thing, it was, the thing with that is that you're not going to earn 50 grand basic salary straight away, 60K basic salary straight. It's just not going to happen. You're going to have to put some grind work in to get those numbers up. So you might take on some clients, learn some experience of client meetings, uh, take on some of the clients that are being passed down from the older advisors, um, and there's a kind of almost a succession plan in place there also as well for the business, isn't it? And then you're going to be building your AUM up. And as you build your AUM up, that's where you're then going to start to see your earnings go up. Because whilst you're building AUM up through internal referral, <coughs> you're also building the confidence, excuse me, the confidence to go out and win your own clients if you're having the best training and the best development uh, in place for you to go out and do that. So it's kind of like a balancing act, isn't it? It's yeah, and it takes act. time. And as Matt's going into year three, he's covered himself now. He's earning good. He's on a good remuneration package. But his challenge for this year is to bring in more of his own business. So I have set him the, the challenge of getting out and finding networking groups. Yeah. So there's a good example of finding. He was able to cho- uh, contact a person I know who's very well connected. And wouldn't you know that five minutes from us, there is a group meet once a month for a walk around this is called Storming Buildings. It's our part of the buildings in Belfast. They meet every Friday morning and they go for a walk around, but it's a structured networking meeting where they'll stop and someone will give their elevator pitch. And he's now making inroads and he's doing a podcast with one of the guys from that. You know, so that's where your network. The shadow would, the mortgage advisor moving across is a bit different because that mortgage advisor wants to get out selling because that's what they're used to doing. Yeah. But the shadow, so Matt, we already have Jack in our office. Who Jack is the, the new Matt. So he's starting out now. He's one year in another practice. He's now started. He's our client manager, and he'll be a client manager for, let's say, a year. Then he'll move to Paraplanner. And then hopefully, if Matt and I remain busy and can bring in enough clients, he will start to take off Matt. The other thing is I am going to be transferring over probably a third of my clients to Matt because I want Matt to be profitable, not Mm -hmm. just covering his costs. He needs to be profitable, and that's what Brett did. Davidson has taught me is he needs to be covering himself his costs by at least by three times. Has that put pressure upon you then as the business owner? Has it put pressure upon you to then step up more so into things like business development and client development? I wouldn't say pressure because that's the bit I love the most. Okay. Yeah. yeah. As well as working with clients. So I'm not going to give them all my clients. But you know what it's like, I'm sure, Sam, when you're in your business, you can get bogged down in spreadsheets and planning and meetings, et cetera, et cetera. 
I miss the old days of just going networking and meeting people. So I'm very much up to that. Also trying to keep the professional connections and and just meeting them and doing things. And also I, I put myself out to do public speaking and just trying. This is why I, I came to you was mm. to let people know more about navigating how we do things. Yeah, no. So yeah, I don't, I don't feel pressure because when you work for yourself, I've been working for myself now for 17 years. I still have that little bit of fear. Well, what if I don't get another client? <laughs> so that we drive is always in you, isn't it? I tell you what, you know, I'm I'm absolutely in that space at the moment. My my happy place. I had this conversation with my business partner today. He's like, Sam, what you need is like what a financial planner needs. A good financial planner goes out and wins business. Is you need a really really good power planner. So we're going to restructure and reshuffle our business around a little bit. Where my business partner is actually like a really good power planner, and I'm a really good business developer. I love going out and having these. You know, I'm sitting here. I got a podcast sitting to you, talking to you, and really discovering and digging deep on your business. I mean, that's great experience for me. It built great relationship. Not only that, but I put it out on the internet and people listen to it. So then people then listen to it and then listen to the conversation. So that builds me more relationships and credibility and trust and uh, a recognition within the profession. So business development for me is like, I enjoy it. You know, it's just a big, big part, but letting go of it. And then but when I business develop, I always end up in a trail of things behind me that need to be done. And then I find those things really stressful. Like you said, you can bog yourself down in a spreadsheet. I can bog myself down in a database, into a sales process, into social media posting and uh, YouTube uh, research and all that kind of stuff. I don't want to do all that crap. I just want to do what I'm good at, which is talking to people, hire the right people to do the things that I don't want to do, but they're good at it. Right. And that's and that's the focus. Um, love that. I love the fact that you're doing that. Was there a point in your career where you didn't want to let go of any, anything and, and, you know, perhaps your very first hire to support you? How did that feel? And, you know, what did it do? I think anybody self-employed, solo practitioner, whatever you're doing, you're I love the book, The E-Myth. So uh, Michael Gerber. And when you start a book, most people just start a business. Like when I went out on my own, protection, I can sell protection, I can sell protection. I never thought about what that business will look in the future. So if you imagine when you start a business, if you and I were going into business now and we drew out a family tree, who's the MD? Because there has to be an MD. Who's the finance director? Who's the marketer? Who's the accountant? Well, our names would be in every single position. But if you start to think, well, okay, well, what does that look like in the future? Uh, and what... Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, so when you, every solo practitioner or someone working for themselves is earning good money, but you got to take someone on. You know you've got to take someone on, but it's going to cost you. And what if you don't have any more clients? And we all go through this, don't we? And when I took on my first hire, it was part-time. And I think from memory, I'm going to tell you six months. It might have been less. But my turnover went up something like 50%, maybe even more, because I found a really good person. And that person came in and said, and they were quite experienced. They said, Paul, you don't need to be doing that. Leave that with me. Get you out and do it. And I got lucky there because she was older and experienced. But I think when you just have to take belief with faith and do it. And I think when I make decisions now, I sit and I look, okay, well, if I'm going to take someone on, how much is that going to cost me? And what's the worst case scenario? So if they don't work out in the first year, you can politely uh, have them leave, shall we say. But what if it works? What is that opportunity that that's allowing you to go out and do? And you have to remember that it's time training them that will lead to the bigger. So I'm always thinking long term. It's a bit like your financial plan and plant the seeds and think long term, not in the next month or two, it's going to take a while. And when I look back now, we have 13 staff. That's going to keep growing because we organically are growing the younger trainee advisor. And you just have to have the leap of faith. But I think my biggest learning was I took a younger guy on maybe seven, eight years ago. Great guy. I met him through a client. Says, would you help this guy? He's trying to get into front service. Really like dress. He was just old before his time. You could tell, he could talk. And I thought this guy could go far. And I brought him in. I had no plans. And I even feel embarrassed sort of saying that now. I had no plan as to what to do. So he came in, he sat beside me. He ended up, he started getting on my nerves because he had nothing to do. And he was then just talking. That was all my fault. Mm -hmm. I didn't have what should he be working on when I'm busy. 
what's his milestones? Where do I want him to be in this amount of time? Etc. That was a massive learning because I had to let him go with a heavy heart and he didn't take it well, as you would expect. So I think there's a leap of faith, but it needs to be backed up with a good plan and try to visualize what success looks like and what are those jobs that you're going to give up. Give up the easy ones, build up the trust, and then you can hand over the keys. I love it. No, absolutely. And you've hit the nail on the head. Look, everyone's done that who runs a business. Take somebody on who walks through that halo effect. This guy or girl is brilliant. They're going to be amazing for my business. They're going to walk in and just pick up the pick up the reins and off they go. They're going to make me money. It all comes down to learning development. It all comes down to um, creating a clear career structure for that person, creating key milestones that they have to achieve, specific mm-hmm. goals within a specific period of time, a time scale attached to it. I failed so many times. I failed many people within my business by not putting those plans in place for them. And as you say, with a heavy heart, you let them go. I look back and I think, Jesus, I've let some good people go because I was shit mm-hmm. at my job. <laughs> yeah, You know, but, uh, but we learn from it. And I think one of the key things that any business can do to, and this is coming from my recruitment hat, okay? Is that let's say, for example, you're sitting down in your in your in your first interview with a with a candidate that you're thinking, I really want that person in my business. It's so important that you can actually put a roadmap down in front of them at the very first interview stage. Yeah, definitely. Because if you get the best person in front of you, and bear in mind at the moment, we're on a bit of a candidate shortage within the financial planning profession. It's, it's, it's tough. If someone's actively looking for a new job opportunity, the likelihood is they're probably three, four, five different companies. And they're all, you know, it's a beauty parade. And they're all, you know, there is a salary back, salary that goes up here and a salary that goes up there. There isn't any consistency at the moment. Everyone's sort of fighting. But what people want to see is what does one year, two year, three year look like? What's my job role responsibilities? How quickly can I go through the process? You've built a mapping process of taking someone from a client manager, relationship manager by the sounds of it, into power planning, into financial advice. So you've built a roadmap. Being able to sit down with someone, articulate that, but then to next to it, put down everything that you actually do for that person to get them there and everything yeah. they need to do to get there. So how long yeah, does it take exactly. to do, yeah, how long does it take to do qualifications? How long does it take, you know, all those things, right? When you do that, and then you put a salary next to it that shows at year one you should be earning this, at year two you should be earning this. This is how what qualifications you should have here. This is what qualifications you should have there. When that person walks away, they should be blown away. They should be like exactly. wow, like, you know. It, there's a clear career roadmap and financial planning companies have struggled to build a clear career roadmap. Therefore, they don't mm-hmm. attract the right talent and they expect the talent to come in and just pick up the reins and get on with it. And we see it lots and lots and lots in power planning. Loads yeah, in power planning or, or from power planning to advice where someone promises the earth that you become an advisor. You're a power planner and you're thinking, I really want to be an advisor. So you go and join a firm. They say, look, you do power planning. We'll train you up to be an advisor. But there's absolutely no plan in place. Yeah. But Sam, does it not amaze you? Maybe it, it, it's it, it's not as common in your... There are firms out there who still won't pay for exams. That's mental. I, I, I just can't get my, my okay. head around that. Get this, I'm going to hoover those those people up because I've got the Financial Planner Life Academy coming out, right? So yeah. we're going to be training administrators. So if someone wants to become an administrator, if someone wants to become a power planner, if somebody wants to become a mortgage or protection advisor, or if someone wants to become a financial planner, if they are in, in a firm right now and that firm isn't willing to invest in them, they come into my community for $19.99 a month with no fixed contracts, and they can come in and get full training and development around their qualifications and soft skills training. We even prepare people for CAS, that type of thing. And and at the same time, if someone say like a second careerist, or maybe they're disgruntled, maybe they're an administrator who isn't being supported with qualifications, training and development, they come into my community. We also have got me in there talking to them about what the market looks like and if and how to get ahead in your career so the, those that aren't investing in their staff 
right? They will go elsewhere where they can get that information. Yeah. And the likelihood yeah. is they'll leave their businesses at, at some point. So it's so super important that learning and development is at the forefront of any hiring strategy. Don't hire if you can't give L&D. The days of saying, I want an advisor who's got 10 million quid under management to come and join me, they're, they're few and far between. You know, they're few yeah. and far between. It's going to get less and less as they, as they, as they um, retire out of the profession. Yeah. You know, it's so important that people are looked after, not, not baby fed, not spoon fed, you know, not cotton wool kids, like, you know, but just supported to be the best versions that they can possibly be. Yeah. But very few traditional financial, good financial planning companies have struggled to scale for that reason. Whereas that's where St. James's place for all their faults are fantastic. And I see where you're coming from. I can see the exact market that you're going after. And what a, this is the thing. I fell into this. I didn't work at school. I am credited. I can't believe I've fallen into a job that I genuinely love. And yeah. uh, and you can make a difference. And I'm anyway not technical in what I do. So I, and I think that's even more so for the younger generation today. Yeah. We talked a little bit at the beginning about social media. And you feel a little, you feel a bit like maybe are you doing enough in that space when it comes to social media and marketing? Do you want to just talk about that and get honest with me? What, what, what are you feeling in that space? Do you feel like you can do no. more? Do you feel like you're missing yeah. out? Do you feel like yeah. you should? Yeah. We employ someone to do our social media. Uh, one of the advisor in the mortgage business, one of the advisors in the IF, in the financial planning business, direct them as to what they do, and they're they're putting out consistent Facebook. We do vouch for, we have had, we've had good online success in our first year. I think we've done 20 grand of, of fees in our first year of joining vouch for, and we've built that up. You know, we've done our video or client videos on our website and we just gradually got it. I think what you and I were talking about is I struggle with brand Paul and what level do you pitch it at? So I don't want to go out being one of these, I hate watching people on social media where life is up. I'm quite sarcastic enough. <laughs> And uh, like, I mean, nothing's ever that serious. You know, yeah. I struggle to get wordy. I, wordy, I pitch myself. And this is why I've, I've approached the likes of yourself to try and maybe do podcasts and be a bit more. There is also that waiting for the, the friend circle to give you a bit of, bit of slack, you know, grief and all that. But that, you can get over that. But I think it's, it's where that actual pitch. And I don't see that many financial planners who do it well. Matt in our office is consistent doing LinkedIn there's no personality in it you know I've told him this he's just sharing important information for me people still come to a financial planner because they have a pain point and you have to fix the pain and then sell the bigger picture which is the financial plan no one ever comes to say I want a financial plan really you know so I think that's what the truth is and that is I just don't know where to pitch it I follow enough people that I just go out I dead on I could just read they're not authentic no. So I think it's about, it's really, really good. It's really honest as well, because there's lots of people in financial planning that I think are struggling with this. And it doesn't help as well with the FCA regulations around marketing, what you yeah. can and what you can't do. So everyone gets really worried about what they want to say. You tend to find that people within financial planning can be overly too technical as well and thinking and worrying constantly about the red tape and what they're saying is right. Is it wrong? Yeah. What, and also it's a, it's a profession. I've never met a more judgmental bunch off. Financial planners are so judgmental. Yeah. And they're so argumentative with each other. Oh, IFA shit. And uh, oh, St. James's place. And yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like an echo chamber of just negativity. Yeah. And don't ever fall into that trap of being somebody that wants to put somebody else down in the profession to put yourself up. Yeah. You are uh, what you come across as such an honest person. You're honest, right? You're hardworking. Um, and you want to you want to help others. That is a brand, right? Mm -hmm. That's what you lean into: kindness, consideration, gratitude, helpful. These are all the things at a high frequency that people connect to. Don't whinge and moan about life and oh, it's so hard and all these typical types of things because people can mm -hmm. latch onto that. But guess who you're going to attract? The the bullshit, basically, yeah. right? You want to simplify what it is that you do. What is it you do? right? Simplify it and explain it in a really simplified way. What problems do people come up against and what part does money play in that? 
things like the psychology of money, money mindset, and money beliefs. But also, I think it's also about establishing and recognizing an area that you are an expert in and that you enjoy. So you can have somebody that's really into therapy, well-being. Yeah. And when I'm 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 toying with this idea, I, well, I'm in the process at the moment of building a financial planning practice. And one of parts of it will be employing a financial planner that is well-being focused and can connect with and become a key person of influence within the therapy circle. And I say right, yes. and I say that because when people go through therapy, maybe money comes up. Money can be a problem. Yeah. Now, one in two people get divorced, don't they? So yeah. what I would want to do is have somebody who understands the financial problems and the financial worries that come thinking about a divorce and during a divorce and after, whether you're female or whether you're male. Yeah. If there's kids involved. Some people are doing that really well. Yeah. And there's kids involved in all of that. But I want to take it to the next level. And I want to bring a therapist onto a podcast and have a therapist and a financial planner. And the idea yeah. is talking about money mindset, money beliefs, and trying to stop people from breaking up if yeah. money's involved. But at the same time, you're adding value by talking about money, by talking about money management and all of those typical types of thing and giving away that free content, that free information. You start to then link in with all the therapists and all the counselors and all those typical things in the space that you enjoy, which is wellness. Someone's probably enjoys that area. Therefore, it's easy to talk about it. Then you become that key person of influence within that specific area. And then all of a sudden, talking about things on social media becomes something you enjoy talking about. Yeah. And it's about picking something you enjoy. If you love cars, if you love golf, if you love football, whatever it is, think about what it is you can lean in. If it's business, you know, one of the things I, I banged on about this a little while back, but B2B. Lots of financial yeah. planners don't do B2B podcasting. It's wide open. You know, what's his chops? Um, I've forgotten his name now. Big high profile planner, The Trap. You know, The Trap podcast? Yeah, Alan Smith does. That's it. The, Alan. He, tar he targets the businesses exiting your business. Yeah. And that's that's the area that I enjoy the most. I, I yeah. would enjoy dealing with someone like you <laughs> who's fast paced, business, understands the pain of staff and running your own business but also want to know where you're going in the future. And that's where I maybe see my career. So yeah. uh, I used to work with a coach, Steve Martin, of the Financial Plan and Trading Academy, and his next iteration of that is where you become a financial advisor through business consultant, and you really get into the business to prepare the business for the sale, but then put your financial planner hat on after. Yeah. And the potential is huge. Oh, that's huge. Yeah. Um, yes. That's, you... that's where I think... That's the bit where I think if I'm going on the LinkedIn, I want to be talking to business owners and properly understanding that you're really busy. You've got a lot going on, but look, we can get you set up, get the foundations and allow that to, to work away. Why not then? I don't know. I'm not trying to teach you to suck eggs because you might do this already. But in that situation, then it's like, well, who holds those? Who, who out there has really great experiences? of dealing with business owners that are revving up for an exit. And that would be like a quiet, you know, people that deal with like acquisition brokerages. Yeah. Right? We don't have that many that I know of here, but good uh, front food accountants yeah. here. And I know, I know a couple, and again, it's about them understanding what, what financial planning is. Yeah. So, so many of the old school preconceptions of commission, um, selling funds and not doing that plan, and that goes back to you need the you need the accountant to be your client. Yeah, exactly. I um, uh, I had somebody I had somebody approach me on LinkedIn recently who's a financial planner, and he set himself up as a financial planner to the e gaming community. Oh, right. so online very, gaming, very niche. Yeah, e sports and e gaming, and wow. and and you know that is niche, and it's very, it's very forward thinking because if you're if you love gaming then you've got something to talk about. Now, 
how many gamers are now earning really good money but don't know much about financial management because it's been their whole time professionally playing games yeah. same as professional sports people isn't it and you've got professional sports financial advisors yeah. i had a chap on the podcast who worked for amazon and he knew about e-commerce a lot of e-commerce stores but obviously he knew a lot about the amazon processes and he also obviously knew a lot of amazon stores owners that were doing really well so he pitched himself as a brilliant yeah I I always go with niche, right? Great if you can find one, but I don't get overly worried about it. But when I hear that, I go, okay, now we're, I think, yeah, now I think, we're really getting into it. And I think it's just, it's just sometimes when it comes to niches, we don't, we try not to kind of narrow ourselves down too much. Um, you know, I've got a whole business that's specifically dedicated to the niche of financial planning. Yeah. Alan Smith, who you talked about before, it goes for the media, sort yeah. of social media type in London. High earning, et cetera, et cetera. And now he's he's moving that towards that business sell out, hence the yeah. Do you which find, is very clever. Do you find when you deal with business owners such as myself that we tend to be so involved in our businesses and we're so future thinking and entrepreneurial that often we're not actually very financially savvy? Yeah, and you're too busy. You need to be careful, I think, with that type. You don't want an entrepreneur who's gonna six, seven percent a year on their investments is not gonna not there to high risk sort of all in type you don't want them because you'll never get them settled down yes but typically i wouldn't say not financial savvy they don't have the time mm. they are the ideal ones because you can get in get the trust get the direct debit set up get them saved and then all of a sudden a year's time they're going to flip this is great yeah one less that's their pain so we we are quite good in that area because matt is 32 i'm 33 are 43 and we have we have picked up quite a lot like that because we have a fixed fee option for for those types of clients not a um based and because i think we're dealing with that all the time and i'm running my own business and uh, i think that they're the ones that i enjoy work and then like you say you just get talking to them and you find out about their business and their opportunities and how people are it amazes me how people are making money i have a really good client she, i call her a friend and she was a barrister and then she changed when GDPR came out, she became a GDPR specialist and now has created multiple products in the barrister community mainly, but this GDPR and I'm like, wow. And the thing is as well, and and and, and this is that when you're dealing with business owners who are business develop who are business focused, so business to business focused, they tend to know lots of other people. Exactly. You know, B2B for me, I'm where I've with financial plan of life is it's a B2B business. Yeah, I've got some B2C stuff that goes on, but my recruitment business deals with that. But yeah. I'm really into the B2B because B2B, like the amount of people I speak to who run their own businesses, I understand your pain of running a business. And I've got a lot of, a lot of experience about like what works and what doesn't work because I look at lots of different financial planning businesses. So we can have some really, really good conversations and I can really kind of advise and consult. And that's what I want to do is advise and consult and add value. I don't want transactional business because I want you to open your book up and say, Sam, I know a few other people you might yeah. be able to help. And that's, I think, that's such a beautiful way for financial planners to market themselves in the b2b arena and then um, i don't know sometimes i think people get a bit put off by b2b because they feel like they might be putting those individuals on a pedestal they feel it must be easier to sell something to a like a director b2c because yeah. it's like their friends etc but actually b2b isn't pedestal based you've just got to approach it in a different way but it, yeah. you need a bit of experience right you also in my experience have to go a wee bit off process so i'm very process driven yeah i would if you become a client that I want you to fill out our client portal and send me their information. Business people are so busy. You yeah. may need you may need to call out to their premises and sit with a paper fact find, yeah. but get the information, take it away, make their life as easy as possible for them. And that, that is something that I've tried to instill in our younger advisors. A really good example of that, because uh, I was given someone a bit of grief recently, was they're waiting for a big protection case to come through. And I say, where are you with that case? Well, I'm waiting for them to fill in the medical questionnaire. And I'm like, for <laughs> just phone them up and ask the questions. Do you, you know, out of interest, do you think that the using of the phone even in some of the younger people that are coming through, and I'm not trying to like say young people are scared of phones yeah. or anything like that, but I run a recruitment business. Yeah. There's a lot more texting, WhatsApping, and emailing oh. that goes on than actually picking up the bloody phone and getting it done. Well, there is probably you and I who are the CBH generation, and then there's that younger generation, and then we've had COVID in the middle. Yeah. 
and it was the only way to communicate. I was taught if you email it, you lose it. So if yep. you email a quote, you for, you know, get on and do it. Get the question aired on. Um, I totally agree with you. Sending texts and I know it drives me mad a wee bit. Make it as easy as possible. If you tell me to, I'm a busy business person. I am a paperwork person, so it does. But there'll be things set my personal stuff set in my desk for for a week that I have to fill out or do, or it's a hassle. Like someone just please do it for me. I'll pay you. It's you know. So yeah, I totally agree with you. Uh, although. My younger advisors would then say to me back, yeah, Paul, would you weren't doing 20 meetings a week? We were able to do 20 meetings in Zoom. You were doing like five, 10 meetings a week and you were out in your car wasting time. So there's a balance in between. Yeah, yeah and it goes back to yeah. what we originally said. There's a certain amount of phone calls, there's a certain amount of Zooms, and there's a certain amount of face-to-face. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't put yourself in, you know, you don't spend 100 percent of your time on social media. I can tell you spending 100 percent of your time in social media will not unless you're an absolute genius. Right. And you're spending yeah. money on it. You're you're, you're going to not make money for a while. Year three was where I started making money when I put my energy and effort into social media. However, I also have a passive income coming from my recruitment company. So I can yeah. put all my time into it and try things and, and build a brand and establish it. It's bloody tough yeah. doing that. And you put all your eggs in one basket in whatever type of strategy you're never ever going to be a hundred percent brilliant you need mm-hmm. to you need to spread yourself out a little bit and you need to try a few different things and um but you need to have so th- some of those clear goals and objectives like you know how many phone calls how many how many um zoom calls not how many emails not how many texts how many phones how many how many um zooms and how many face-to-face meetings yeah. you know that's yeah. that's key um i also think on the social media side following you you share everything so that gives me, so since I came across you, find you on LinkedIn connected, you put a post out about, do you want to go on the podcast? Yeah, right. Who is this guy? Went, and I can see you at home with your family, with your fitness, right? Okay. So you're sort of starting to get a profile of that person and what you do. And then I think we'd probably get on because we're into yeah. the same things. And then all of a sudden you're building that network. And I think you're talking, I listen to Trap every single week. Love it. And I think Nick Lincoln uh, put that out one day about how you can go and target clients straight away, company's house, get the director's name, get in touch with the directors. If you look for that in that episode, it's brilliant. And he's quite right. It's the yellow pages of today. Yeah. And also you got to think about, right, let's say, for example, you built a podcast. Let's say you had an idea for a podcast and you wanted to build it up and you wanted to get it out there. Using a podcast as a business development tool is hugely impressive. I can go to some. I can go to one of the biggest companies in the UK. Tell them I've got a top ten podcast on the Apple Careers podcast chart. I'm an expert in careers. I've got this much audience, and this is what I talk about. Can I bring you on the podcast? And they're like, "Well, yeah, great. Yeah, you know, we've got a financial planner. We've got this, that, and the other." Once I'm through the door, not once have I said to you, "Have I? Can I have a vacancy to work on? Can I do exactly. some business with you?" I just talk to you. We build a relationship. But if something comes up where you need some support and some help and you know that I can deliver, the likelihood is we're going to connect in some way, right? It's a softer landing approach. It's easier to build the relationship. And I think often relationship comes first. You you, you have to get that relationship part. And it goes back to what you said about the BNIs, about the networking events. Because when you went and did that, for instance, and started networking with professional introducers, and you didn't get business straight away, right? Did you? You got a return on that investment of time a bit later on. Yeah, and you have to be prepared to give. So BNI's uh, philosophy was uh, help others to get what they want and you'll get what you want. And that might be that you give me a referral someday. It may not be me that gives you it straight back, but someone else might just give you one and you all of a sudden you're going, flip me, that all came from that. And that's the way it works. And if you do that with your, that's what I always say to the artists, just treat clients the way you'd want to be treated. Keep them updated. Let them know where they are. Be honest with them. You know, and do right. Look at the long term. You look at the lifetime value of that 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 relationship, and you'll always be okay. And that's that's why I've done it. And I'm 21 years now since the first time I sold an investment. Can I ask you? I'm going to sort of finish up quite soon. Mm-hmm. I'm, I really want to ask you a question about you. Look, you're a business owner. Okay. We haven't even got into the whole, what's it like running your own business and all of that mm. kind of stuff. I think, you know, to got to where you've got to, and you've been really open with your, with your opinion, and everything, but let's flip it here. Right. You run a business and you interview people for your business. What advice would you give for say 
somebody that's going into an interview for administration or power planning or financial advice, um, maybe it's their first interview process. Maybe they're jumping from one job to step up into another one. Maybe they come from a different career and they're a trainee. What questions do you think they should be asking the business owner of a financial planning business? What should what what things should they be looking for when it comes to the interview? Because what you don't want is someone going in there and just taking anything, you know, oh, I'll take anything. I just want to get in. I just want to get my foot through the door, Yeah. you know, because sometimes that's a wrong thing to do. So what advice would you say to those people who are going to interview the candidates? What should they be looking out for? And perhaps what questions should they ask to test the knowledge or to test the value in the culture of that business? Well, you're asking the wrong person because I hate interviews. <laughs> the biggest pile of crap. Uh, and <laughs> we all just we all just spin a uh, really good question something i've never thought about before my last it was a guy called jack future shadow advisor it was actually matt who would be his his sort of next lineup and our hr manager who did the interview i then took jack for tea because i wanted to know more about jack and what he was doing and I like to look to people who play sports, people who go to the gym, have a bit of consistency, you know, maybe are part of a community. Mm. I like to notice that that gives me. So that's how I sort of have done it. But Sam, but what one of the things I liked about Jack was I had heard about Jack. I, I didn't connect the dots till after, but a year ago, because he had written to all the financial advice firms and Belfast offering his services, even to work for free. I think if I was doing that today, doing that today, you know, younger ones should be using video, you know, go and learn how to do a cash flow plan, do a video showing you how to do it and flip, you'll make people sit up. I think for me, you have to be interviewing as much as they, they have to be interviewing you the other way around. Because I think, especially with this younger generation, and I talk about this quite a bit with clients, the younger generation know the work-life balance better than we do. And I think COVID again has done this. They don't want you know, they have to have their life outside of work. It's not all about, I don't know if you find that mm. there is, there is definitely this, that has changed a little. So I think they need to be asking about how are you hybrid working? How yeah. do you deal with, how do you deal with if my, uh, um, I've got my parent teacher interview or my kids in sports day, how do you deal with that? What do you do with this? What's your, prog- do you, what's your career progression? Obviously I've got great case studies, but Go back to paying for exams. It amazes me. I know a good friend of mine who's going to leave his company because one of many reasons, but one of the reasons they don't support him. He's yeah. a fantastic, fantastic advisor. Um, they're the things that I would be asking, but you have to have the balls, but don't you, Sam? Because yeah. when you're young, you're dying to get your foot in the door. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's the thing. But I think also from the business owner's point of view now, you need to put out as much about your your staff, how you do stuff. So, for example, if you come into our office now upstairs, we have a wall, big sign in the middle of Good Times Rules, and it's pictures of all our staff from their home, from their kids or their dogs. And that, to me, is the, the ethos. We go for, like, because we have hybrid teams and working, we would go for quarterly walks and stuff to make sure we bring everyone together. But, again, that's all about culture mm-hmm. then we post it we post it so you, that's for future recruit future employees to have a look at us from the outside and i think you want to be doing that what else do they do because you and i might think an office walk or paying for exams are just a given there are many companies that don't so much there to unpack and i'm, I'm just going to just go over it because i think there are some really good points that you made there one was you know jack went out and he he he, he marketed himself to companies And I liked what you said about the video, because a person could now go onto LinkedIn, they could post a video on LinkedIn talking about what they're looking for, their experience and uh, their, their reasons for wanting to become a financial planner. You can send a message directly to anybody with any firm. So you could do a quick list, right? Go on Google, who are the companies within my local area? get all the email addresses down and perhaps get a person from that website that's a key person of uh, interest to you to get your foot in the door. Could be a power planner, could be a financial advisor, it could be the business owner. Send a message on LinkedIn, connect with them and follow their companies and start commenting on their stuff. But also send a message. You can send a voice note. You can send a video now through the chat 
on LinkedIn. So having the bollocks to actually put a little video, hey, it's Sam here. Um, I'm part of the Financial Planner Life Academy. I'm doing my qualifications and the Financial Planner Life uh, host, Sam Oaks. Um, I've learned this about da databases and systems, and I've just passed my RO1. I'm now looking for a new entry point. I've done some research. I've done some research and you're a company I'd love to talk to. If you can help me, or even meet with me to give me some pointers that would be much appreciated. I mean, if that landed in your inbox, what would you say? Well, first off, if I didn't have a place, I would certainly be thinking, hold on a minute, who in my group? So I have a mastermind group here, I'm part of the next gen community here. Yeah. I would be straight on going, guys, who's looking for someone? I've just found someone who I think really different or worth talking to. So yeah, they, especially the, because many times you meet a young one, really good with IT and then they send you on CV. Yeah. And I think yeah. the other things to unpack there is that you took you hit the nail on the head. I love that you take people out for that tea and you get to know them. You get to know about them, their what they do in the community. Because community is a really important thing. Connection, yeah. it's, a re it's a really, really, really important thing. That's what makes us happy human beings is connecting with others, right? So seeing have they, what do they do? What clubs are they part of? What do they do um, to support people? Do they do anything around mental health, charity? Um, is there anything that they can talk about where they give back? Because I think that's a good sign in somebody as well. Yeah. <laughs> but also, that, you know, that's really, really interesting. You said they're also about c c culture. So you've got that wall with all the pictures. Love that. Now, look, that's the old traditional way of doing it. But if you've got an Instagram page and on that Instagram page, you put everything up there, which is about your culture of your business. So we're a B Corp. So we put everything about B Corp and the things mm -hmm. we do around B Corp. We put our lunch clubs on there, all the things that we do, like volunteering, bit about the culture of the business. So when someone's already come to see me or before they've come to see me, they already have a good feel and a good understanding of the culture of the business. And hopefully that should answer lots of questions anyway before they come in and hopefully they built a deeper connection and more often than not when someone comes into my business they're like i've been on your site i've done this i've looked at the social media i've seen financial planner life i love it and it's like half the battle yeah. isn't it it's done yeah you know, it's done yeah. um from a business owner perspective and but it also gives that person something to talk about now if they haven't done any of that and it's all out there then i say to them why haven't you done any research yeah so that's yeah, a, but you know straight away, don't you? Yeah, because if, as a business owner, right, if someone walks through my door and asks me questions about my business, right, I don't take that personally. I don't go, oh, how rude. You know, I'm talking, I'm no. interviewing you. I love it. I'm like, wicked. Tell me what you saw. What do you like? What would you change? What did you, what, what, what was interesting about it? Because I want to learn more about that person. But also I'm observing and I'm listening to them articulate how, you know, what they like about it and all those typical things that go along with it. So I love all of those types of things. And I think you're absolutely right. Just have the courage when you go into those meetings to ask those questions, to ask about career development, ask about work-life balance to ask about the things that you're doing outside of work can i see my can i see my kids can i work from home can i do this what do you do for holidays because i think that's hugely important to the next generation massively important. yeah i agree i agree it gives you a feel for where they are where they came from yeah i think for me my la other than jack the last the three hires before that was three people i knew or knew of so i think recruitment is about looking so i'm not looking for anyone probably this side of Christmas, but I'm always thinking who's the next person who, so a, a guy who was a mentor to me, two of his sons work here now. <laughs> there we go. So, yeah, because we followed the rules through and, and uh, he he he's a regional sales manager for our network, but he's been a big help to me for probably 10 years. And I was all, I like, I know the family, I know the background, I know their stock, you know, you know where they came from and what they stand for. Yeah, fantastic paul listen i'm going to bring this to a close now because i could talk to you all day but you've really shared some really interesting information a about your career but also your thoughts and your feelings around how to get into the profession what to look out for and i think anybody listening to this whether they're experienced in the profession admins power planners financial advisors trainees anybody that's listening to this or somebody that's coming in from a second career and thinking about getting to the profession i think there's loads there to digest loads of really really good information so I really appreciate your time today and okay. um, let's keep in contact and um, I wish you all the best with the future of Navigate. Same to yourself, Sam. I'm looking forward to hearing more about the Academy. I think you could be on to a winner there. Uh, thanks for the opportunity.